Hi, everyone. Good evening. We are ready to get started. We will let um, some stragglers pop in um, as, as uh, we're going on. I just want to thank everyone for joining us this evening for a discussion with, in black, with black environmental professionals. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Amali Knoblock and I'm the Outreach and Engagement Manager here at Hudson River Sloop Clearwater. Um, and environmental education is my passion, is my joie de vivre. Uh, Clearwater was started uh, in 1969, launched as a boat built to save the river which was at that time a dumping ground for industrial waste. Since then, through more than 50 years of environmental advocacy through education, half a million people have crossed the deck of the sloop, many of whom's first interaction with the river took place on board with the captains and crew. Clearwater's Crown Jewel is the sailing classroom program through which every day 100 students from far and wide throughout the entire watershed come sailing, go fishing, and learn about Hudson River ecology. I saw Ruthie drop the program brochure in the chat earlier, so you can take a look at it there. I'm so glad to see registrants from nine different countries with names I recognize and names I do not. I just want to keep in mind for everyone that this event was designed and advertised for Black environmental professionals, those who are retired, and those who are aspiring to be in this field. So if you are here and you are not Black, I just ask that you are aware of your privilege to be in this space um, and to check that at the door, especially uh, during the Q&A period. So tonight we're here for an event that is very near and dear to my heart. Something very special is happening tonight. It's five Black environmentalists in one room together. Oh, actually six, including me. And it can be really tough to be underrepresented or undervalued in your field. And I'm thrilled, excited, impressed even to be here with my industry colleagues who I think are so fun and smart and deserving of praise. I've actually invited them here with this elaborate ruse just to get them to be my friends. Just kidding. <laughs> Am I though? Anyway, we thought it was important to share our work and discuss community, the environment, and the Black intersections of community environment together. Our first speaker is Tanasia Swift. She's the field program or field station program manager at the Billion Oyster Project, a scuba diver and a resident of Brooklyn. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Amali, for the amazing introduction. Uh, so being that I know we have but so much time, I'm going to try to keep my talk just about or under 10 minutes. So I'm gonna share my screen just really shortly. Um, just give me one second. Uh, Ruthie or Molly, can you give me screen sharing access for a second? All right, there we go. All right. And we'll start from the very beginning. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Tanaja Swift. I am from Brooklyn, New York. And I work at the Bain Oyster Project. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself and then the work that I do with the Bain Oyster Project just to give everyone an idea in terms of like what I'm gonna be discussing today and also how you can get involved if you're interested in restoring oysters or environmental work or volunteering, especially here in New York City. Um, so a little bit about, about myself before I go on to uh, talk about BOP. Um, I'm a Brooklyn native, so from Bedside originally. Um, I went to the New York Harbor School, which I'll also speak about shortly in my presentation, but it's a maritime high school located in, um, right now, Governor's Island. At the time that I went to New York Harbor School, it was located on, in, in Bushwick High School, um, which is just a, a community in, in Brooklyn. I'm a scuba diver, as mentioned. I studied at SUNY Stony Brook University. Um, after, essentially, my educational career, I did work at the Brooklyn Music School and ended up at the Bay Oyster Project also Superhero Clubhouse member and created this community group called Water Women NYC just last year. Um, so I'll talk about just some of the things that I do and sort of like how I got into this field um, just originally. So water has been a part of my life since I can remember. So I grew up um, essentially in, in Bed-Stuy, which is a landlocked community, but I spent a lot of my weekends sort of like fishing with my father or just exploring 
um, in my teenage years at the New York Harbor School. And my love for marine science, swimming, scuba diving, the water was just like probably too big for me to even fit into one person. Um, and then it also felt really, you know, uh, like a small community because there weren't many people who looked like me in this field or were interested in swimming. And of course, there's the stereotypes uh, that you have to deal with as well. But then as I got older, I realized that this is something that you love or I love. And there's a community out there of people who enjoy doing this with me. And I get the fun job of working at the Bay and Oyster Project, teaching New York City students about our waterfront, getting them involved in oyster restoration, and then also in my personal life doing open water swimming. So that photo at the lower, where I guess your lower uh, left is me, uh, swimming at a beach in um, the Rockaways, creating water women and then scuba diving. So once again, water being a huge part of my life, environmental work uh, being the inspiration and of course, youth development. So as mentioned, I work for the Billion Oyster Project. And who are we? What exactly do we do? So some of you may have heard of us before, but we are a nonprofit located in New York City. Um, we're based out on Governor's Island. And our goal is to restore oysters through public education initiatives. So we started out as a small program in the New York Harbor School. So once again, New York Harbor School being a public high school. So it's uh, a public high school, just like any other high school located in New York. Um, and we are a CTE high school, so career and technical education. And this means basically that there are these tracks or career fields that students are learning. Um, so they're listed here. So aquaculture, professional diving, marine systems technology, vessel operations, ocean engineering, marine biology research, and marine policy. So all of these are maritime related careers that students are learning about. So during their freshman year, they get to experience a few of these um, careers, exploring them. And then by sophomore year, they're choosing which ones they would like to do. Now, what does this have to do with the Bay and Oyster Project? Um, so aquaculture was one of the CTE programs and we work really closely with Harbor School. So students were doing research on oyster restoration in New York City. And then the founder of the New York Harbor School, Murray Fisher, and a teacher at that time, Pete Malinowski, who's also the founder of Bay and Oyster Project, decided that this can be an entire nonprofit. And so that's how the Bay and Oyster Project was founded in 2014. Uh, so as mentioned, the CTE programs are geared towards uh, maritime careers and students are working alongside BOP to conduct oyster restoration, whether it's you know, building some of our reef structures, diving at some of our uh, reef locations, planting out oysters, growing out oysters, building robots. It's a pretty cool school. If I could, I would go back. Um, and so why oysters? What does the Billion Oyster Project do? So as mentioned, we're trying to bring back these oysters to New York City. And so oysters, they do a couple of things for our environment. So the benefits of oysters include filtering water. So they are filter feeders. So the more oysters you have, they're able to cycle nutrients through the water column, creating better visibility. Um, habitat creation. So they create habitat for other fish and critters. So that image in the back of this presentation screen is actually one of our reefs in Sunset Park. You can see the colors. It may not look like something that's here in New York City, but I promise it is. Um, so fish are hiding, crabs are hiding. They like to find food. Uh, they act as nursery grounds for a bunch of different species and shoreline protection. So oysters have the ability to protect our shorelines um, in a way that mangroves or different species kind of does in, in other places. So this is why we're trying to restore the oysters back to New York City and of course, majorly connecting New Yorkers and students to our harbors in a way that we haven't necessarily done before. So uh, a huge emphasis on public education and just getting folks to the water. And what happened to those oysters? So we've lost over 200,000 acres of oyster reefs since the 1600s. Um, and that's because of dredging, pollution, and overharvesting. So oysters were a huge part of our history. So from the Lenape, who are the, the you know, native people of New York, to the point where New York City's shoreline became industrialized. And it really got to the point where we started to deplete that population but we're trying to bring them back. And of course, because it's a huge task, we are using community science, um, what's also known as citizen science, but we call it community science, to make it a community effort. So we're working with students, as I mentioned, bringing New Yorkers, specifically those who are underrepresented to the field. They're working alongside us. We're learning from the community. Community members are planting oysters in their backyards. 
uh, with the Bain Oyster Project. And it's an educational tool that teachers and public schools can use um, as a way to get students involved. And hopefully, you know, we're planting the seeds for new environmentalists. Um, so I'm gonna just show a few images of what these oyster reefs look like because uh, sometimes it's hard to visualize these things. So this is one of our reefs, or this is what it looks like from above water. Um, so reefs are planted near shore. The idea is that during low tide, we can wade out into the water, pull up a portion of these reefs and bring them to shore to monitor their growth, how big they're doing. And of course you find different critters, which I think the students love. I probably love it even more. Um, and then with time, the oysters start to develop this structure of their own. So they're growing into this 3D structure, lots of sponges and algae um, and fish and crabs a lot like to attract there. And then the bottom image is an installation that we did last year at Brooklyn Bridge Park. So you can see the New York City skyline just behind us. Um, so this work, once again, is happening right in the heart of New York City, all throughout the five boroughs. Um, so we have these field stations. So I don't have too much time to get into to depth about it. Um, but there's lots of life living in our harbor. So in addition to oysters, I wanted to show a really quick video, once again, because I geek out a lot about a lot of things that live in our harbors. Um, so I just wanted to show a quick video. So there was a time where we were scuba diving in Jamaica Bay, and we found this like super cool critter. And for many years, you know, it's been hard to even visualize what's living underneath the water. So I'll stop talking and I'm going to just play the video. Um, so let's see. So yes, that was a seahorse. So we have lots of life um, in New York City. So once again, you know, lots of life here. And you can see the oyster shells just at the bottom there. And to wrap up just really quickly. Um, so my information is there. So if you're interested in learning more about the Bay and Oyster Project, visiting some of our reef sites or fill stations, my information is there. So tswift at newyorkharborschool.org. Or you can also visit bayandoysterproject.org to find out more ways to get involved. And thank you so much for your time. I'm looking forward to hearing questions. Thank you so much, Tanasia. Yes, again, if you have questions for her, please drop them in the Q&A. Uh, that is where they go. Uh, our next speaker is Jerome Cunningham, self-proclaimed Harlemite with the ability to connect his passion for nature with his creativity as a spoken word artist. And he is a development and communications associate from Ground Her Groundwork Hudson Valley. Welcome, Jerome. Thank you, Amali. Uh, and thank you all for this opportunity. Uh, Ruthie, um, if you have my slides. I am indeed ready. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, again, my name is Jerome Cunningham. I'm the Development and Communications Associate at Groundwork Hudson Valley. Uh, and uh, when asked to share how I got into the environmental industry, I wondered where I should start. And since I have a little bit of time tonight, I figured I should start here at the beginning. A high school specializing in environmental studies had made its home not too far from Columbus Circle on the concrete island of Manhattan. I had not even heard of this school until I was informed that the charter school I was set to attend would not open on time for its prospective first graduating class. When my grades were sent around again, the High School for Environmental Studies was one of the schools that accepted me. I enjoyed watching Animal Planet with my dad and uh, I had a gardening job at junior high school and that was pretty cool. So I chose the High School for Environmental Studies and said, let's give it a shot. As for the photo on the right, my high school had partnerships that made it possible for us to go out on nature preserves to do invasive removal, trail maintenance, and a variety of other stewardship activities. 
When presented with the opportunity to take on one of those internships, I said, let's give it a shot. It cannot be overstated how important it is to educate our children early on about what it is to be a steward of the earth. This also exposes them to the fact that there are careers dedicated to keeping the earth healthy and they come in many facets, facets that I would soon learn about. Next slide. My outdoor experience in high school had opened up my eyes and I wanted to know more. So I sought out more. Next slide. I searched for more internships to get more conservation experience. I got the chance to work on preserves doing habitat surveys of various flora and fauna, uh, GIS data collection, signage, wetland restoration, uh, and the list goes on. In all this time, I'm learning more about the field and I'm learning more about myself. I took the time in those internships to reevaluate my skills and passions, and here's where I landed. Next slide. I made a switch. Uh, well, not a complete switch, but a switch nonetheless. I envisioned myself still making a difference, ensuring a healthy, sustainable planet. However, I did not see myself doing it the way I had been up until this point. Even though all of my experience was fieldwork related, I still stepped away and said, let's give it a shot. I declared advertising and public relations as my major in college. I explored and completed internships related to fundraising, marketing, social media, and database management. Next slide. My first full-time position out of college consisted of providing grants and support to schools across the country for nature-based projects and green infrastructure. Throughout my tenure, the program engaged and reached over 130,000 students nationwide. I joined the employee resource group called LEAD, uh, which stands for League of Employees of African Descent. I was given the opportunity to hone my skills as a speaker and moderator for the discussions that would amplify the voice of Black environmental professionals. This photo is from one of those discussions as I interviewed Outdoor Afro CEO, Rumat. Next slide. Some of the folks I networked in this journey told me about the Environmental Leadership Program. The mission of the Environmental Leadership Program is to support visionary, action-oriented, and diverse fellowship for a just and sustainable future. ELP aims to catalyze change by providing emerging leaders with the support and guidance they need to launch new endeavors, achieve new successes, and rise to new leadership positions. Since 2000, they created a dynamic network of over 1,300 of the country's top emerging environmental and social change leaders. The fellows I knew from this program all spoke highly of their experience, citing the quality of the training, the opportunity to grow their network, and the diversity of ideas that were celebrated. In the midst of a transition, I was encouraged to apply. And to that, I think you all can assume what my response was. The experience was pre precisely what was promised. It's always fantastic to see updates from the fellows in my cohort. At this point, it's now time to fully transition to a new role, not knowing where I would land as I set out into the job market. Next slide. And it would land me in Yonkers. Now, what business would a kid from Harlem have in Yonkers? While in my last role, I had lunch with Groundwork Hudson Valley's executive director just to catch up his friends. Uh, I wasn't looking for anything at the time, but one year later, there was an opening that was perfect for me. And I now hold the position of development and communications associate here at Groundwork Hudson Valley. Groundwork's mission is to create sustainable environmental change in urban neighborhoods through community-based partnerships that promote equity, youth leadership and economic opportunity. My role consists of developing and executing marketing and fundraising strategies. Much of my time is dedicated to mass outreach to our constituency via social media and email campaigns. 
I'm also designing more of our print outreach materials. This role spans across all of our program areas, those of which are youth engagement, sustainability, education, and climate resilience. So what exactly am I doing with a shovel? Next slide. Working at an organization that is so close to the people it serves affords me the opportunity to occasionally go back to my roots, no pun intended. This is a photo of us on the Groundwork Science Barge. It's a floating educational center on the Hudson River that hosts classes on environmental sustainability, renewable energy, and various growing systems. The growing systems you see here were used to scale up our produce on the barge. Now, why would we want to do that? It's because the harvest would be donated to the local YWCA for the women seeking shelter, shelter there. Next slide. As depicted in the photo on the right, I got a chance to clean up the Sawmill River running through Vanderdark Park in Southwest Yonkers. My experiences have allowed me to adapt to a multitude of situations and priorities, all for the sake of bettering the communities that I serve. Speaking of communities that I serve, next slide. Youth like the ones depicted in this photo call these communities home. It all comes full circle for me when I see our green team. It is incredible to see such dedicated, hardworking, and diligent youth putting forth their best effort to improve their home. I look at them and I'm reminded of the beginning of my journey. They also remind me to carefully observe my own obstacles and say, let's give it a shot. Next slide. So that is the synopsis of my story and the way I got into the environmental industry and uh, my current role and how I serve the community. But the, the recurring theme, as you may see, and I hope you walk away with this, is when you see these different opportunities, these different challenges, these different obstacles, I hope you all take a look and say, let's give it a shot. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerome. I think that like that is a shared experience that that a lot of us probably have is like there are these opportunities for us that we didn't know about. And um, I'm so glad you got a chance to like take advantage of those opportunities as a young person. The more and more I meet um, other people in this field, I'm like, well, why didn't I know about that? Why wasn't I invited to lead, you know? Um, so it's really great uh, to hear that. Um, our next speaker is Benita Law Diao. She reminds me of all of the women that I grew up around, my mom's friends, the women at church, all my aunties, um, because she is a woman of many titles. Um, she has her hands in a lot of different pots. She is the Cornell Cooperative Extension's Master Gardener. She is the Patroon Creek Greenway Feasibility Study Community Liaison. And she's the Outdoor Afro Albany and Upstate New York Administrator, as well as many, many other things. I'm so excited to hear from Benita. Welcome, thank you. Thank you. So I'm speaking to you from the ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee in Latham, New York. And I've worked as a pub in the public health sector for 40 years. I grew up in New York City between Queens, Bronx, and Manhattan. And um, it was during the 70s that I became woke as a teenager because of the oil crisis. Um, now I'm retired and I've, um, I've been able to focus on my attention on a lot of the things that I've always been passionate about. And I've only been able to give limited time to, and now I've just dived in and I'm busier now than I was when I was working. But these are things that I truly care about. Um, I strongly believe if we unify and we put in the time, we can really make a difference. So ever since, ever since the seventies, I've been environmentally sensitive. And when issues would come up, I tried to learn as much as I could. I tried to share what I learned and I tried to bring people along with me. And I hope I, I know that 
my um, other panel, um, new panel friends who I hope to get to know. I love them just from what they do and I get, hope I get to know them better. But I know that um, they're doing a lot of the things that I've always wanted to do and they're sharing and they're bringing people along. And I hope that our listeners will do the same. Um, because of that background, I um, learned about Outdoor Afro. And that's, I realized when I learned their mission that they're all about celebrating and inspiring um, black leadership and connection to, to nature. So I um, applied to be a leader for Outdoor Afro and I went out to South Salido for the training and they do skills development. This is an annual training. They do skills development training and ongoing support so that I can get out and be more effective in, in reaching the local community. And so they have such an incredible marketing ability. And I thought, well, me alone trying to do this, um, I'm not as effective, but if I have outdoor Afro behind me with their marketing ability and all of their framework, I can bring a lot more people along. And then I found my community because I'm often the only one who likes to do the things I like to do in nature and outdoors and you know, working on environmental things. Turns out that all my family, I mean, my outdoor Afro family, they, they en enrich me, they um, just make me stronger and teach me new things. So that's how, how and why I got involved in outdoor Afro. And so I'm just gonna share some of the things I've done in the community through Outdoor Afro and then independently um, through other kinds of um, partnerships that I've had over the years. I've gone back to programs that I used to work for and said, look, I'm really trying to connect people with the outdoors, with the environment, um, to share what I know and to hopefully help them understand um, the environment better. So um, this past, past year in 2021, I'll give you an example of some of the things in 2021 I've done. Um, Eagle Island used to be a Girl Scout camp in the Gilpin Bay of Saranac Lake. Um, it was an all girls camp and the uh, alum decided it, it got decommissioned in 2000, I know 1971, excuse me. And they really wanted to keep the island for camp, for a camp. And the alumni, they'd go, you know, really gotten so much out of this camp that they, didn't want developers to get hold of this piece of property that was in beautiful forested lake um, area in the Adirondacks. They wanted to keep it there to inspire and empower girls as they had been inspired. But they realized when they went to camp there, it was not diverse. And this and the, the that generation of women that went to that camp, they decided, no, we're gonna raise money to buy the camp and we're gonna open it up to a more diverse community and we're gonna help make girls, um, women and girls um, confident, collaborative and courageous. So they, um, someone from the camp um, introduced themselves to me and asked if I can come and work with them. I'm a dietitian by training. I help them set up the camp. I'm an advisor for the camp. And then I thought, wow, you know, we're going through a lot with, with COVID. Um, it would be nice to be able to bring a group of outdoor Afro, um, people who are interested in outdoor Afro to the island so that they could be in nature and to unplug and rejuvenate. And so in order to get to the island, you have to drive to Saranac Lake and then you take um, a pontoon boat over to the island. And these are people who had never been in the Adirondacks before. And they got to stay, the island has historic Adirondack style buildings. It's got um, uh, platform tents and it's also got cabins. So the people who came there with me were able to stay in any one of these facilities that they wanted. They got to go ki kayaking and hiking and they stayed on a beach. Uh, so that was one really enriching weekend where they got to do yoga and hear loons, the loons at night. Next slide. Another experience that I was really lucky to be able to give people in the midst of COVID, um, and, and I just want you to know that, you know, I, I'm especially sensitive about um, at least making sure that people are, were COVID safe because I worked for the health department and all the things that I've done over the years in public health, 
that whenever we did any of these trips last year, we made sure that people were safe, safe and felt secure. So I partnered with the Department of Environmental Conservation. And even though all the campsites in the state seemed to be filled up, we were able to secure a campsite in Lake Luzerne. And I was able to um, operate a first time camper program for eight families, 15 adults and nine children who had never been camping before, didn't own the equi any equipment. And you know, one of my biggest barriers is equipment and transportation. So we were able to get these families to Lake Luzerne. We gave them free camping gear, a tent, pads, chair, cook stove, sleeping bag, tarp, camp light, and a few other things. Um, and, and within a few minutes, these families, they didn't know each other. None of them knew each other, but they started to help each other and share with each other and cook with each other and talk. And the kids felt so safe. They started wandering around the, the, uh, the camp um, ground exploring. And my heart was so full just to see what this did. I mean, you saw people who work, you know, crazy hours during the week start to unwind and start to just feel like a family. Um, we gave them um, instructions on, you know, safe ways to camp and where to camp and we had activities for them. And then DEC staff, I mean, I'm so thankful because they volunteered, they didn't get paid. A few of the DEC staff said, you know, this is something that's really meaningful. We're willing to come and volunteer for the weekend and help you out. Um, we, every, everything that I do outdoors, I teach leave no trace. Um, and then also I tell people about the history of blacks in the Adirondacks. Almost, I, I would say at least 80 to 90% of the people that I know, people of color, don't feel comfortable going in the Adirondacks. And I can tell you a significant number of those have never been and really don't want to go unless someone were to help them get there and know where they could be safe. So there, it, those issues are out there. And what I do is I share the history of Blacks in the Adirondacks and I let them know we have every right to be here. Next slide. I was, um, I was the local president, oops, back, back a few more slides, back another one, oh, that's it. So I, um, I served on the board of Hosteling International for a few years. I was the president for the Mohawk Hudson Council of um, Hosteling International. And I got involved in um, Hosteling International through Bike New York, which is the bicycle tour. And they, um, whenever, when, the Bike New York Five Borough Bicycle Tour first started out. Um, they used to host it from the hostel in New York City on, um, I think it's on Amsterdam and 103rd Street. So once I realized there's this thing called hostels and I, you know, if I had known about this, I would have traveled the world, you know, while it, because it's an inexpensive way to, to travel around the world. There are hostels all around the world. And they're dormitories that you can stay in and they have kitchens, you can cook your own food. So it's an inexpensive way to travel. So I um, was on the national board and last year they offered me an opportunity to stay in their hostels and bring a group of um, outdoor Afros there. So we chose Martha's Vineyard because whenever we do an outdoor Afro trip, we try to teach the history of blacks or, or how blacks can, um, connect to the places that we take them hiking, biking, kayaking, or any of the things that we do. So we went to Martha's Vineyard, stayed in the hostel, and me being a dietitian, um, I felt strongly that, you know, we should cook a meal together, and we cooked a healthy meal together. We did um, Bokwa, which is a South African version of uh, Zumba. We went to Black art museums. We toured, the, went on Black history tour, tours of um, Martha's Vineyard. We did campfires. Um, so this was a way, another way for us to unwind, for us to be with people that we feel comfortable with, to just, you know, just let go and be who we are and not feel the tensions that we do in our day-to-day -day work. And I can tell you that, you know, people just really let go and relax and said how much it really helped them in this difficult time during COVID. Next slide. I'm on the board of the Adirondack um, Center for Loon Conservation. Um, one of my friends um, is the founder of the Adirondack um, 
Center for Loon Conservation. And because I really want us to know that we have every right to be in the Adirondacks, I take people there quite often. I've, that was my ter part of my territory when I worked for the health department. And I don't know, I never, I, I guess I have this arrogance about me where I felt like I have every right to be here. So I've never felt like I shouldn't be there. I never felt threatened to be there, but I do understand why we would feel uncomfortable going there. So what I do is I bring groups up and, and as a group, we feel more comfortable together. And um, loons are, they're a gauge of how healthy um, an ecosystem is. And so if you don't have loons in an area where they had been populated, then it gives you a sign that something's really wrong here. Um, so the director, um, Dr. Nina um, Schock, who is a, friend, a dear friend of mine, she um, went out with us to go um, canoeing. And my group did, had never been canoeing before. So we got to give them canoeing um, instruction. We got to teach them about the Adirondacks. We got to teach them about loons. And um, just once again, um, ch climate change. And then um, they do loon counts every year. Um, and for me, I love loons because of their call. Um, they give this beautiful haunting call. And you know, now this group of people, they wanna do it again next year. And, um, and some, a lot of them wanna bring their kids to share this, but it's kind of woken them up to the environment and let them know you know, how fragile it is and that they can, they can make a difference. Next slide. So I, my favorite thing to do is community science because I did not major in environment, environmental science. Um, all through my life, I just kept um, having these things happen, happen that really impacted me. I went to college when Love Canal was discovered in, in Niagara Falls. I went to college in Buffalo. My roommate was a New York public interest research group. Um, she was the president of that organization and she pulled me into environmental protests that she did. And so throughout my life, I kept being in places and spaces where I was seeing these environmental crises that were really getting to my heart and my soul and it made me want to learn more. And I have been learning over the years. My graduate project in, um, was about um, organochlorine contaminants that are in fish in Lake Ontario and the Hudson River and how, it act, how people were eating this fish. People who were supplementing their incomes for food were eating this fish because they didn't know that they're eating PCBs and DDT and anything else, mercury that's in this fish. And I learned about all these things from a nutrition perspective and what it was doing to them. So I, I also host um, community science um, opportunities and I love Tunisia and you'll be hearing from me because I want to bring a group to learn about what you do and, and, and actually do some hands-on things. Um, here we, um, I partnered with um, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's WAVE program. It's water assessment by um, volunteer evaluators. You can go to their website and you'll see this. Um, we actually sample streams for uh, macroinvertebrates to see if the, um, the presence or absence of certain macroinvertebrates. And that will tell you how healthy your stream is. And we, if you see from this picture, the little boy in the picture, he's four years old and he helped us. And we, we collected samples, we sent them to the DEC, and then they sent us reports back, letting us know um, what they found with the invertebrates that we, macro invertebrates that we sent to them. Please um, move on. So anything that helps me learn, I love to share. Um, in Albany, we have over 800 vacant lots in the city of Albany. And um, luckily the Albany Land Bank is trying to address these vacant lots um, and vacant buildings. But um, oh, oh, I think it was 2010, um, there, a vacant lot project was created and we were able to take this vacant lot that had hypodermic needles and heavy metals because a lot of the construction companies you know, instead of them taking it to the landfill and paying to dispose of their, their uh, debris properly, 
they were dropping it on these vacant lots in Albany and then kids come along and play in this, you know, on these lots. And so there's this one lot that really um, would, would, would have put kids in jeopardy. We cleaned up the lot and then we decided to turn it into a garden. We called it our children's garden because we knew if, if the community knew it was for the children, we wouldn't have to worry about vandalizing it. Um, and then we never put a fence around it. And people said, well, people are gonna steal the produce. And we thought, well, if they steal the produce, chances are they need the produce. So we're not gonna put a fence around it. And we never had a problem. But um, the kids, we had each, each raised bed in the garden had a different theme. It had, we had one that had edible flowers. We had berries in another one. We had leafy greens in another one. We had a pizza garden in another one. But a kid would come along and she would bring her friends break off a piece of an edible flower and say, you can eat this. And the kids would stand there and wonder if this person was gonna keel over after they ate the flower. I mean, this child was our best educator in the community, but through this project, we taught about the flora and the fauna in the community. These communities didn't, they don't know that they've got possum and woodchuck and um, skunk in the community. Um, they don't know where their water is coming from. So through this project, I was able to teach people where what their source of water was, how it was being treated. These are the ways that you connect people to the community. Bring it, start in the community where they are. Let them, let them understand what's going on where they live. Where well, your garbage does not magically just disappear and go nowhere. It goes to a landfill that has is, has a fine is a finite place. And so these are the things that I've been doing in the community to connect people where they are, so that I can show them a broader world. Once I get them to see their own community and, and understand what's going on in their own community from an environmental perspective, it's easier for me to take them in the Adirondacks or in the Catskills to other places. Next. Oh, sorry. So I moved into someone else's slide. So I, um, this is my passion. I am so thankful to be retired and to be able to do this. I love what I do. I love my community, but I care about the climate. And I really hope that I can wake people up. I can connect people to things. I can get children to you know, want to go into fields that are gonna help us, help us make this planet a better place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benita. You do and have done for a long time really, really wonderful work. We're so glad to have you here today. Our next speaker is Megan Lung, self-proclaimed troll in the mud, clearing out culverts, um, is an environmental analyst with New Pick, working on behalf of the Hudson River and its tributaries with the New York State Department of Envi Environmental Conservation's Hudson River Estuary Program. You got it all, Amali. I try. You got a mouthful there. I know. It's really difficult when my parents ask, uh, so who do you work for? I'm like, oh, that's a complicated answer. Um, we can go on to my first slide. I'm going to try and uh, keep it brief because I want to hear from all of you and what your questions are. Um, so I am indeed a troll by birth and raising. So for I saw some Michiganders, including my little sister, but I'm from around here from a town uh, city called Utica, which is in the Detroit metro area. And I'm going to start by showing some pictures um, of my family, of my sisters. Um, uh, my oldest little sister is joining me today. I'm super happy to have her because she has been one of my best friends uh, the whole time. I've been one of my greatest supporters. But a lot of times kind of growing up, and I'm just, you know, you see my parents to kind of give you an idea. I get this question of what are you a lot? And I want to encourage all of you to never ask that of someone. Um, you know, when we were, when uh, we would be asked this question, like when we were, you know, little first, they would ask it to our mom or our dad in the grocery store. It tended to be with like, you know, someone's um, hands on us, like either like stroking our hair or like looking at our faces and trying to, and, you know, asking like, oh, where are, what are they? Where did you get them? And my mom's response would always be like, those are my children. I grew them. Please take your hands off my children. So I want to encourage, like, you know, when we think about what are you with anything else aside from humans? Um, you know, this, the social construct of race, you know, has real implications for us. But when we're talking about people, race is a species. So when someone asks me what I am, I say I'm a homo sapien. Um, so that's kind of like kind of how I wanted to start that because it's gonna, gonna kind of be like a theme um, in my talk, but next slide, please. Okay. 
we can get a great close up of all the face paint. Um, I'm seeing a black screen, but I'll, I'll keep going. I'm sure the slides will catch up. Um, so my first kind of experience with science and like, you know, I struggled for what kind of scientist I wanted to be because I couldn't pick. I wanted to be everything. I saw a Jaws when I was way, way too um, young. And I decided I wanna be a marine biologist. I wanna be a shark biologist. Um, oh. Okay, the computer's freezing. It's okay, we'll, we'll get there. Don't worry about it, Ruthie. Um, but you know, there, there aren't really any, there's no sharks at the, at the aquariums in the Metro Detroit area, but there is this wonderful place, the Detroit Zoo um, based in Royal Oak. And I spent so much time here as a child, as a teenager, as an adult. Um, I actually got engaged at this zoo. And if, um, if the stars aligned, I probably would get married at the zoo. They have a cutoff at nine o'clock for the animals. So that's why I'm not gonna get married at the zoo. But my parents took us here all the time. My grandparents took us here. And I, at one point, could tell you like the story of every single animal in the Detroit Zoo. In particular, um, Jacques the Hippo. I have a really memorable instance of, um... oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm eavesdropping at the chat. I'm not gonna do that. Um, I have this really big memory of uh, the Detroit Zoo had a big male um, Afri African hippo. His name was Jacques super, super cool. And like, I was just so fascinated because he was so big. And at the time where the um, anteaters now are, um, it used to be the hippo pool. So you could see the hippos come out and, you know, they'd lounge around a group of hippos is called a bloat. And there was one time, and this was, um, uh, this was back when I was about five, I had crept a little bit closer than I probably should have. And someone took a picture of Jacques like lounging. And I it was at that age, I realized how fast hippos could run and how big their jaws could open. So Jock did not enjoy that flash. And he, you know, he gaped and he charged into his pool. And my, you know, my grandpa thinking quickly scooped me out of the way. So I didn't get splashed with, um, with a uh, poopy hippo water, but that was kind of where I was just like, animals are awesome. I want to do that. Um, so next slide. But for those of you like me, um, I have a, so my dad is a American citizen now, but he is initially from the Colombian Caribbean, a little uh, archipelago island called San Andres. And for those of you who have immigrant parents, um, your career choices tend to be, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, or you can be the president. And the entire time growing up, like, you know, my dad would listen to me, like my dad would take us, you know, to the outdoors. Uh, my dad taught me tried to teach me how to swim when I went with him to Columbia once, but he decided that he wanted to play a uh, shark and grab your daughter. So I didn't really learn how to swim with him. I learned how to swim with my mom in like Michigan with my sisters, you know, holding onto her back and learning how to float. Um, but it was always doctor, lawyer, president. And my parents would definitely humor me. Like they would get me all kinds of books, but it was still always doctor, lawyer, president. So when I got to college, I picked biology, um, but I still couldn't quite make up my mind. Next slide. Um, luckily for me, I went to, um, in my humble biased opinion, I went to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, the best school in the world, in my humble opinion. And I was really lucky enough in that I got to explore everything I wanted, which made it a little bit difficult for me when it came, when push came to shove. Um, so I got to, um, I got to, uh, study in Peru in Spanish. Um, and, you know, I was fortunate enough to be in always in a cohort where it was really diverse. I saw people in my classmates who looked like me. And that was just really impactful. And you know, I took that for granted a bit as a young adult versus what I know now at age 30. Um, so for those of you who are college age, and if you're looking for an experience to really get out there in the field, um, Michigan has a biological field station uh, for, the, for the Michiganders here. It's located um, here near the Mackinac Bridge at the tip of the mitt. And you can spend eight weeks in the summer doing field science. You know, you're in small classes. Um, this, on the top of the beaver dam here, this gentleman with the stick and the cool hat. Um, his name is Paul Webb and he is an awesome limno like wizard. He is so cool to, to learn with, but you get to do this hands-on science. They will teach you real techniques and you will, you know, you'll learn how to do research and you'll write papers. And I really enjoyed that perspective. And that is what kind of, what kind of made me solidify. I'm like, okay, ecology and evolutionary bio. Cause I still am not very good at math. I did not do very well at biochem at all. So Doctor was out. 
doctor was out of the question. It was kind of a relief. It was like, woohoo, I did so, I passed biochem with the skin of my teeth. Now I don't have to be a doctor. So I picked biologist. Um, next slide. Um, so I graduated and I had my first, um, I wasn't ready for grad school. I'm still not ready for grad school. So I took my very first conservation job with the Student Conservation Association. I took it at their field, um, their field core in Massachusetts in the Berkshires. So I spent 10 months uh, kind of in the wilds of Massachusetts, not the wilds of Massachusetts, in the Berkshire Mountains. Um, and I made some lifelong friends. I have huge, you know, a huge, wonderful network thanks to the SCA. I have skills that I still use today. Um, in particular, you know, I learned how to be a leave no, tra leave no um, trace trainer. I learned how to build trails. So my friends and I here were standing on top of a rock staircase and we built that staircase. And each one of those rocks <laughs> easily weighs like, several, several hundred pounds. The rule was, you know, if you could move the rock by yourself, it wasn't big enough, go find a big one. So I learned how to build trails and I got really, really good at swinging a hammer and with a, and hitting a rock and making what we call crush to hold the, hold that staircase into place. So my trail, I got a trail name too. My trail name was Rocky. Um, cause I was really good with rocks. <laughs> um, and it was really great. And I also got to teach, um, outdoor education, a local school. And I never thought that I would be any form of a teacher but it came so naturally to do that. It was just so enjoyable to take my students out or bring them to our, um, at this program, you live on site. Um, so we got, they came out for a science camp and you know, I, gra I grabbed a bucket and like we went into the pond, I dug up some sediment and like I found some bugs for them to ID. We did that similar to the WAVE program. We did that, um, those macro ID. And you know, I was teaching my students as young as like first grade. Like, oh yeah, like, yeah, this is a, this is a caddis fly or, okay, we got a stone fly here. But one thing I noticed with this that I didn't, I didn't notice growing up in, you know, the Metro Detroit region, I didn't notice in Ann Arbor. I didn't notice when I was in Peru or when I was at the field station, there were really few people who looked the way I did that were doing this kind of work. Um, go ahead next slide. And I, so I also got a history degree at Michigan because uh, Michigan is quite expensive. So I was like, well, if I'm here, I might as well get a second degree. So I picked history because I've always been a bookworm. Um, so I put that history degree to use, you know, more and more and more reading lots of books and just making lots of observations. And, you know, coming to this realization that the founders of, you know, this uh, Western, this European idea, idea of conservation in America they didn't probably, they probably would not think that people who look the way that all of us do, the look the way I do, have a, would have what, you know, a right to the outdoors or to the environment, which is, you know, wild because it's for everyone. Um, this idea that nature is pristine and must be protected and you must keep nature separate. That's just not realistic. That, that's not ecology. That's not the way how we have evolved. That's not the way how a lot of species have evolved. We are one with the environment. So it is always our right. And there's a lot of historic um, and current, you know, even current, um, you know, we saw a treatment of how black and brown bodies interact with the outdoors. I didn't really understand this. So, you know, my father is, my father is black, but my father is from Colombia. My father was a fisherman uh, for many years. My father, um, you know, I eat, I eat a lot of, like a lot of fish. Cause like, that's what, you know, we were raised on. And there was also this unequal access to opportunity. So, you know, I touted the SCA program, but you know, I was paid, and I think the members there are still only paid $90 a week. Um, your housing is paid for, all of your food is paid for, but if you have any kind of a any kind of a bill, any kind of a car payment or you know, student loans, $90 a week is not sustainable. So you have to be in a privileged position to get into these. Um, you know, and even, yeah, and I have more, I have more to say about that. You know, I know the SCA is working on that, but. Even, you know, in my current role at the yesterday program, and I'll, my last slide will show you why I call myself a professional troll, but, you know, I do a lot of work looking at dams and culverts, and I'm trying to figure out which ones can we, uh, where can we make them better? Where can we remove dams like this, both for fish and for people? And you may notice in the lower right-hand corner of this picture, um, you can see a young, a young Black man fishing. And when we saw this out in the field, I was like, oh, this is beautiful. Like, someone's fishing. It was a gorgeous day. Imagine like how this stream, how this ecosystem, how the fish populations can recover. If we can take this dam out that, you know, not a lot of people are using that's kind of just sitting there rotting. And what happened when the, um, the escort of this dam saw that there was this young man fishing. Um, and, you know, our escort prior to this had been really 
adamant that we don't even touch this railing that was <laughs> that's in the lower left hand corner because it was kind of rusty. You know, he had been so adamant that we don't touch the railing that we don't get too close on the viewing platform. He kind of mumbled something and he left a group of, you know, 12 of us to go, you know, call the authorities on this young man fishing. And he, you know, there's, there's no posting and, you know, it's in that either you could argue like navigable river too. Like there's, you know, we have every right to enjoy these with, with, I should say within, you know, considering property and trespassing. Um, but, you know, we went down and we just, you know, we warned him like, Hey, like, you know, good to see you. Uh, you know, the guy, the guy is calling the cops, like, you know, you might want to skedaddle. And, you know, I had this thought and I still have this thought today when I see this picture and I talk about this experience is if that young man had been white, would he, you know, would the guy, would our guide have been so quick to go call the police and leave 12 people unattended? I don't think so. So, you know, that, that is something that I think about a lot and we can go on to the next slide. And I think this is my last slide. But, you know, so what does that mean? So for my work, like, you know, I'm still pushing forward to um, restore stream habitat. I crawl into culverts and under bridges for a living. Um, so for those of you from Michigan, uh, you know this joke. But for those of you who are not from Michigan, I'm going to let you in on our great secret. If you are from the Lower Peninsula, you live south of the Mackinac Bridge. So you are called a troll. You're called a youper if you live in the Upper Peninsula and you live north of the bridge. So I tell my parents I'm a professional troll and they seem, they seem to get it. Um, so, you know, you can, I, I also have the privilege of supervising an SCA member every year. Again, like, you know, the pay is not what it needs to be, but you know, it's, it's better than $90 a week and there's a housing stipend. So, you know, I can hire one person a year to come work with me. Um, if you want to be my SCA member, put an application in, um, you know, come December, you know, let's, let's talk. I want to interview you. Um, we, I can teach you how to culvert and do this. I can teach you to walk in streams. Um, it's really kind of cool things that you see in a stream. Or even if you just want to get out in a stream and you've never thought about, you know, how, where do I step foot inside of a river? How do I get inside of a river? What are all these things I'm seeing? Send me an email. I love sharing these things. And I think that, you know, knowledge is something to be shared. And, you know, I mentioned Paul earlier, you know, the limno wizard. He always used this phrase, you know, I've got all these nuggets of wisdom and I can't hoard them. So I also can't hoard my nuggets of wisdom. So if you wanna come out in a stream, if you want a nugget of, knowledge, nugget of wisdom from me, you know, come and take it, it's there for you. And I think, I think I'm done, thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. I know that I feel like we've been playing email tag for like two years now, but I'm so glad we finally got a chance to meet each other and I can't wait to keep working with you. Um, our last speaker, certainly not, uh, la not least, not the least, last but not least, is Zoraida. Zoraida Lopez Diago is the program director at Scenic Hudson's River Cities program and the co founder of Conservationists of Color, a national affinity group established to change the face of leadership in the environmental movement so that it represents the diversity and the richness of all of the communities that they serve. And I think that's a little bit of the work that, that we all do together is, you know, one by one um, changing the faces by being in leadership and then holding institutions accountable um, and, and charging them to do this work on their own. Thank you, Zoraida. Thanks so much. Um, thanks so much. And it's been uh, such a pleasure to hear how everyone uh, entered into the environmental movement. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I um, ended up at Scenic Hudson, and I'll talk briefly about my program. Um, next slide. So um, as I mentioned, I'll, I'll talk about myself for a little bit, my program, how we work and where we work and what's next on the horizon. So just a little background um, about me. Um, I think I was like uh, really, really lucky. My mom actually works for um, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection for the state of Connecticut. So she was their affirmative action manager. And every night we would have conversations around the dinner table that focused on how everyone, regardless of gender, regardless of race, regardless of sexual orientation, just deserved access to open space throughout the state of Connecticut. And it didn't matter where you were from, where you lived, what language you spoke, but everyone 
deserved to feel safe in the outdoors and they deserved access to the outdoors. And so I thought about that, you know, a lot um, while I was growing up. I didn't immediately go into the environmental movement. I started working for labor unions in California and in New York City. Um, I went back to school for sculpture and photography. I ended up becoming a consultant for um, Columbia University in African American Studies, really building and developing programs from the ground up. And then I um, ended up in conservation, working in communications. And through that job at Westchester Land Trust, I founded Conservationists of Color because I just kind of how Amali started, really wanted to meet and find other people in the conservation movement that looked like me. And I did, and Conservationists of Color has grown into a 200 plus national affinity group. So I'll put my information in the chat after if you have any questions about my work or about conservationists of color, please, please, please send me an email. And so those are kind of the middle two photos. Um, it's a conservationist of color Zoom call um, we had during COVID and um, me speaking at um, LTA's rally, it's a national conservation conference right before COVID. And the last photo is me on my first day at Scenic Hudson, getting in the Fallkill Creek with waders on. Um, the program that I direct, the River Cities program, is, to me, it's a really kind of cutting edge program because it's a conservation organization that for one is thinking about cities and thinking about cities in a really equitable way. So how do you work side by side community members? Um, how do you make decisions together? How do you really value um, folks in communities and really, really value their knowledge and their expertise and hold important space for them? And, you know, how do we really ensure that everyone in the Hudson Valley, regardless of where they live, have access to open space and can get the benefits of open space. Um, next slide. So we work in three cities, Poughkeepsie, Newburgh, and Kingston. I'm gonna talk briefly about two projects. I was listening to uh, Benita talking about the community garden and it made me think quite a bit about this project in um, Poughkeepsie that is located on a small block, Pershing Avenue in the city of Poughkeepsie. Um, it has a park, you can see in the upper photo, there are basketball courts. There was kind of this empty lot, city owned empty lot behind it. And there's a um, housing facility behind that. And the empty lot, when we first kind of looked at this space, there were tires there, there was a mattress across the street, similar to what Benita said, there were needles. Um, and what we heard over and over again from community members was that they wanted opportunities for youth. Um, they also wanted clean, good, locally grown produce close to home. And from this site on Pershing Avenue, it's also a block, a formerly redlined block. Um, it's about a 32 minute walk to the nearest like good grocery store with decent prices and like about a 20 to 25 minute bus ride. Um, Poughkeepsie is also a place where a quarter of all children are deemed as obese. And there's a pretty high percentage of folks that don't have access to a car. So having good, clean produce close to home is really, really important. We worked with the church. It's the kind of that white structure um, in the front of the upper photo. So we worked with the ministers at the church there um, to really think about how we can create a community garden and urban farm that serves um, the community. And we also worked with a local youth bill program to get young people to kind of 
help construct the shed for the community garden. And we made sure that everyone who worked on the projects got paid a living wage, which became even more important, you know, prior to COVID, but now with COVID, ensuring that people are able to sustain themselves is kind of even more, even more dire. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can see where we are now. So after a couple of years and obviously setbacks of COVID, we have a like an amazing farm with 19 garden plots, all serving the local community, the north side community. We were really adamant in the fact that only nonprofits and um, people who live on the north side pretty close to the farm can have a farm plot. Um, we have 19 garden beds. We bumped it up to 22 and we have a wait list. And the other side of the site has an urban farm. Um, that's our urban farmer, Nick, in the photo to the far left. Um, and the foods from the farm are going to be going to the folks that live in Coralies in um, the housing complex behind and to um, Duchess Outreach for their mobile market. So we're really excited. This is gonna be like our first year fully on the ground. Um, we had an opening harvest festival in the fall, but we're just super excited to see how this project unfolds. Um, next slide. And so when we cross the river, we cross the Mid-Hudson Bridge, and we drive down the road a little bit, we're in Newburgh. And the River Cities program, we really think about where we work. And Newburgh is one of these cities, like so many cities in New York State, Hudson Valley in particular, that's facing gentrification. So it's really important to Cena Hudson and to my program in particular, that we that we, you know, we don't work on the streets that already have a lot of love, that already have thriving businesses, but we hear from frontline organizations and we work with them and we're able to support them where, where work is kind of really critical, where it's needed and in neighborhoods that are all too often under-resourced. Um, so if you go to the next slide, you'll see for a community-driven street tree project, we were able to kind of determine where to work by looking at GIS data and figuring out where our community partners were working. So where like Habitat for Humanity was working, where the local land bank was working, the Parks Conservancy, um, a few other organizations that we have partnerships with. And we also wanted to work somewhere that had a some type of block association. Um, we layered that on top of a map that showed housing density and showed empty street tree pits. And through our relationship with Habitat, um, uh, one of our partners said, there's this really great block, South Miller Street, um, with a lot of Habitat homes and land bank homes. And I think they would be interested in developing a street tree project. And I think what's especially important with this street tree project and just kind of how we think about our work in general is we bring community organizations um, into the project from the very beginning. So we didn't invite the block association when we kind of got to the point of just like planning the planting day, but from the very beginning, thinking about how do we select trees, um, where do we get the trees from? How do we develop workshops um, to ensure that neighbors are storing their trees? And then we also attended their street tree cleanups. So it was a nice, really equitable relationship where we worked side by side, this block association. Um, if you go to the next slide. Yep, so this is the block. You can see um, the picture up top is like, what the um, block looked like in the winter. Nothing looks good in the winter. Everything is really gray. And then we did a rendering imagining, you know, what it would look like to have trees on the block, <laughs> excuse me, to have some flower plantings around the trees, to have um, 
uh, street tree parking and a bike lane, just kind of envisioning all the things that could happen on this block. And then you can also see the community partners we, that we worked with. It's fine, you can go to the next slide. And so um, our um, um, uh, street tree, uh, one of our street tree team members, um, said, you know, why don't we have the planting around Mother's Day? So shortly before Mother's Day, we planted about 10 trees on the block. Um, we had a celebration cake. One of the neighbors DJed. Another young person on the block actually created our flyers, and we were able to pay him to create flyers for the day. We had barbecue. We had food. It was just like a really, really nice way to celebrate the planting of these trees, which, which in many ways turned into a catalyst. And um, from this point, other organizations in the city of Newburgh have continued to plant trees as well. And that's, uh, that's about it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zoraida. I really, really appreciate that. Um, we are ready to move into our Q&A segment. Thank you all for bearing with us. I know we're over time, but when we had our run through yesterday, we had so many wonderful conversations. And so I would really like a chance for you to, to join us for that. So um, I'm gonna ask a mix of questions that I've prepared and, and those that are in the Q&A. And I'd actually like to start with the first one from the Q&A box that's for Tanasia about scuba diving lessons or certifications um, that are run by black owned businesses. And this asks specifically about Los Angeles, but I'm actually curious if you know anything um, about any uh, black owned scuba diving scuba lesson organization. Yeah, so one of the largest sort of like community or black run community groups for scuba diving is NAB, so the National Association for Black Scuba Divers, so NABS, and they basically have chapters all over, so the West Coast, the East Coast, Northern region, so if you just look up their website, so NABs, there's sometimes different clubs within a region, um, you can find the club that's nearest to you, and most of those clubs are various. They're, they're real different, but you'll find lots of like black scuba divers, instructors. Um, and if you're certified, you can also go on uh, a trips as well. So definitely check out NABS um, if you're interested in scuba diving or you know, getting your certification and just joining other black scuba divers. Awesome, thank you. Um, this one is a question from me. Um, are there any ways that we inherently knew or even did not know um, in our work that we found out throughout our work or that we knew beforehand about the way that Black people, either in the Hudson Valley region or elsewhere, interact with the environment? Any take? Um, yeah, so I can, I don't know if that one was directed towards me, but I can definitely answer sure. that. Um, so I, I feel like, you know, growing up, just speaking a little bit towards my personal sort of like um, journey in the environmental field and how that's developed. So being in an environmental field, I'm sure most of the other panelists can also uh, protest to this, but you feel like there's not many who are, you know, of your background or who are Black, who are interested in this field. So it feels very isolating in the beginning, you know, whether you're going through your education and career and being like one, uh, very few um Black people in your class and as you go up in your major you're seeing that it dwindles down the number of Black people who look like you who are going into this field or continuing on um, but then through research and sort of like changing the perspective of how we see the environment you realize there are so many different pioneers and people who have not been included in the history books that are a part of the environment you know it was one you know a post that I saw you know when we talk about nature and the environment we're always thinking about um, like these picturesque blue spaces, green spaces. Um, but then we have parks that are in inner city communities that are part of the environment as well. You know, there are groups that are doing, you know, park cleanups in urban neighborhoods. Those are environmentalists as well. So the fact that they are not usually a part of the conversation or even giving limelight in terms of who we associate with environmentalists or not, um, kind of like dwindles, sort of like our view of who we see as black environmentalists. 
Um, so to answer your question, it seems, you know, like there are lots of people out there doing this work, but sometimes they don't get the spotlight that they deserve or just get the recognition or even just like internally, people may not even see themselves as environmentalists just because of what we have seen or, or been portrayed as being a scientist or someone who's an environmentalist having a degree, et cetera. Um, and, I, and I realized we interact with nature in so many different ways. This is a, a loaded question. Like just with, with water, like sometimes it's mind boggling to even know that like my ancestors, our ancestors have traveled um, through water, had this relationship with water. You know, these particles at some point that I'm swimming in New York Harbor were some of the same particles that my ancestors interacted with. Um, so the fact that there are so many connections, whether through land, earth, um, indigenous spaces, you know, we're all connected. Um, and the way that we interact with nature is very different, but, you know, we exist. Definitely. I think that um, that's a really wonderful way to put it. And, and people are environmentalists without knowing um, is a big, big thing to take with us um, from this talk. I see Benita's hand up. Would you like to weigh in? So. I mean, Tanasia being a scuba diver and doing the kind of work that she does is incredible. And I so admire her for what she's doing. But so many of us don't have opportunities to learn how to swim. I grew up in New York City and I never learned how to swim till I went to college. And right now with Outdoor Afro, I'm working on an initiative to try to get um, swimming lessons, access to swimming lessons in our area. We've lost all four of our inner city um, YMCAs that had swimming pools in Albany, Troy, Schenectady. And, you know, so to have access to pools, to teach kids to swim, um, and then a lot of the other um, misconceptions we may have about swimming um, stop us. But I mean, this project that I'm currently working on to one, try to get um, kids access to pools so they can get access to lifeguards and learn how to swim. I'm also talking about careers that you, you know, if you knew how to swim, you'd be able to do these things. So um, just to know Tanisha, and hopefully I'll be able to partner with you, bring some kids down so they could see what you do. And, and you know, hopefully we can put a light out there for others to want to get into occupations where you get to swim and get to learn about the environment and get to contribute, you know, um, to the environment, to um, climate change. Yeah, and my spiel kind of about why um, environmental education means so much to me. Um, it's kind of about the difference between my upbringing and, and the kids that, that I interact with. Um, I feel like, you know, I grew up in Baltimore City, but I had a yard and, and I lived near um, a small forest. And so I felt like, you know, every day I could run outside barefoot and my feet touch the ground. And so um, Tanasia just kind of reminded me of that of like being able to physically interact with the environment is the first thing and so for a lot of kids in the city um are they're growing up not having touched even the ground um one of the things that we do on on the sloop is talk about what is dirty versus what is polluted and like this um way of thinking that we have about like the ground being dirty and that we shouldn't touch it and that we can't, oh, we have to wipe, you know, ourselves off and things like that is, is a big deal. And so um, being able to physically interact with the environment, um, whether that just means your soul's touching the soil or going swimming. Um, and as Tanaja said, you know, connecting that with those who have been here before us and, and what that means to us is, is a really big deal and, and really changes how we think about and how we invest um, in the environment. Zoraida? Yeah, I just um, um, just wanted to make the point that, you know, more often than not, Black people, like, are a solid vote when it comes to voting for, like, climate change issues, um, when it comes to voting for issues around the environment. And there's so much more that we know than sometimes, like, we're giving credit for knowing and just kind of like understanding. And oftentimes our communities are the frontline communities that are affected by climate change. And so um, we see it like, I'm sure Tanasia, you know, can talk about it. Like you see it in New York City with like Sandy, for example, um, the folks that got most hit um, are, are black and brown communities. And 
um, there's, you know, we don't have to like convince ourselves of climate change. We know that climate change is real and we believe and support environmental issues more often than not than, than so many other um, than groups out there. So I just wanted to make sure, you know, when we're kind of like when we talk about folks of color and black people and like our connection to environment, there's just so much inherent knowledge that we understand and we kind of move in a direction um, that, that kind of speaks to that knowledge and experience. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, that's kind of what we want to go for is that like, just like Tanaja said, there are not what we think of conventional ways to be an environmentalist or to interact with the environment or to know about um, the world that is around us. But um, our community has such a strong relationship um, to nature that it's really important to continue to bring that up and to um, continue to share that and spread that and, and make sure that that's something that people know. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what it's kind of like to work at, at nonprofits um, and, and for state agencies. I think that a lot of the time um, we know that we're going into these majority white spaces. And so there are things that we do um, and themes, I think, that have come up for me when I hear people talk about what obstacles they think they face with their coworkers of color and specifically um, their black coworkers or even um, participants in their programs. And that is like this, you know, obviously very implicit bias, but saying, well, they were kind of standoffish or like they didn't want to be my friend or like that kind of thing where, you know, as a black person in a majority white space, a lot of the time, yeah, I deserve to be here. I'm living my life out loud, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're comfortable interacting with all of the people in our office in the way that they are comfortable interacting with each other. And sometimes that is just because of their shared experiences. And so I was wondering, um, from many of our panelists, how you kind of protect your peace in the office or how you set boundaries to kind of combat that we have to be a family, and if you're not a part of it, you don't like us narrative that, that we have here in, in um, environmentalism. Uh, Megan, I see your hand up. We haven't spoken to you. <laughs> Shout out to, uh, you know, my boss, Fran Dunwell and Scott Cuppet for uh, teaching me some of these boundaries. But um, yeah, um, I, you know, I think I, we're a little fortunate in that, you know, we are aware, my program tries to be very aware of that. So some things that I do personally is that, you know, I, you know, my office is in New Paltz, so I live in Westchester. So to protect my own time with my commute, I don't take meetings after a certain time of day. Um, I tend to be doing my last email checks at 3.30. So I decline meetings if someone is like, oh, like, can I meet you at four? I'm like, no, you can't. I'll be on the road. You can't. Or, you know, I don't answer my phone on the weekends for work. Like no one is ever going to call me about a culvert emergency. And it was really intimidating to do that at first, especially if you're a newer, um, newer employee to an organization, there is a lot of pressure to, you know, put in that extra. So I think there's a, you have, you know, you, everyone I think will judge this for themselves. You know, you also don't want to be out the door at three o'clock either. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't look good, good as, as well. But I think it's, you owe it to yourself to like, say like, you know, like, sorry, I, you know, this, this is the boundary. Like, you know, it's not, it's not a personal thing against like the person who's, you know, trying to set that meeting at four o'clock. It's just, sorry, you know, I don't, or not even sorry, just can we, can we reschedule? I don't take meetings after a certain time or, Hey, I am, I am not working. Like I'm with my family. I'm not going to answer a phone call from work. Jerome, what about you? What do you think? Um, I just wanted to add on to what Megan made mention of, and I think that um, establishing those boundaries in the very beginning is the key. Um, when you are first entering these spaces and making uh, and making known of, of, of the the like pretty much level setting on the onset, because uh, that allows you the space that if you uh, aim to uh, stretch out a little bit more later on, if that is indeed the decision you decide, um, you could do that with the understanding that 
the boundaries are the rule and not the exception. Yeah, absolutely. I think, especially in, in today's world where the part of the pressure is like, and now I need to friend you on every single social media platform and I need to follow you. And, and you know, the idea that like all of your coworkers are supposed to be now allowed into your most private interactions with like your friends and your family or like see your everyday life when you're not at work is extremely like in anxiety inducing because and, and this is true for anyone, the way that you are at work is not the way that you are at home. And, and there are not things that you are always wanting to share with people. And there are not things that maybe you even have in common with anyone that you work with, except for the fact that you care about the environment in this specific place and you work on the same program. Um, and so I think, you know, I think that there's something that we are all able to do. And that's definitely something I, I, um, hope that the community that's here is is hearing that that the pressure to be a family the pressure to like know everything about each other and to eat lunch together every day and to like follow each other and to comment on their stories and to do all of that really has nothing to do with whether we like you or not but really is about this is my life and my life is actually private and I choose not to hang up pictures in my cubicle or, or whatever is the thing, or maybe my desktop isn't a slideshow. And so I think there are a lot of little things that um, are perceived to be standoffish about, um, especially black people um, in sailing and in the environment um, that are uh, more like self-defense mechanisms or self-preservation mechanisms. I'm gonna go on to the next question. It's related to this one. It's just about whether the pandemic has shifted um, our ratios in, in terms of work versus re rest or work versus interacting with people. Megan said she does her last email call at, or look at 3.30, so that we're not gonna take meetings for the rest of the day. Have we changed our schedules um, in any way? Uh, yeah, uh, so I have, um all the panelists saw on the call, I have an eight month old and I have a seven year old and COVID has, I think we've been in, in some ways it's broken down some hierarchies because we're able to be in every person's home. And so, you know, you're able to see like your, your EDs, children <laughs> uh, screaming for pasta, you know, at three in the afternoon. And so, you know, in some ways, um, it's good at the same time, um, you know, I've been, try, I've been trying to be really aware with my team. And I think at Scenic Hudson, like we've been trying to just really be aware of like Zoom fatigue. And because now you can just, you can stack meetings in this way. Like before, let's say you had a meeting at 10, you would kind of give yourself time to go from like one meeting to the next meeting. You would have to physically kind of go to different locations, but now it's like 10, 11, 1130, 1130 to 1145, you know, 1145 to 115. It's, it's just um, stacking. Um, we have a policy of no meeting Fridays, which I think is great. And that has been just really helpful in not you know, actually kind of like, you know, getting our work done. So we're not just zooming, zooming, zooming um, all the time. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. I know I'm really looking forward to just being like back in the office uh, for a couple of days and seeing people face-to-face, -face, especially in this work. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the mistakes that I made in the first year of the pandemic was finding myself on Zoom until like nine o'clock at night and sometimes later than that, because we like, um, what is so amazing about all of us is that we have all of these pieces that we're doing and, and they aid toward the same goal and we have extracurriculars and some of us have kids and, and all of that, but like realizing that like, oh, I can actually get so much work done if I'm not commuting or uh, if I don't have to walk to a new place to have a meeting. And so in the second year of the pandemic, really cutting that back 
um, really, really helped me is that like, actually, I'm not going to meet today. I try not to take meetings on Mondays or Fridays so that I can get all the work done I need to get through, you know, on the first day of the week and then really finish strong on Friday. Um, because before, you know, feeling like I need to take every meeting I can, I need to meet with um, each department, I need to meet with each partner um, every single week just became so exhausting. And I just, you know, got burnt out like many of us have. Megan, what about you? Yeah, I, I have definitely, I have definitely stacked. I have been stacked upon. I have done the stacking. Um, and what I try to do now, if I schedule something, I try to send it out like on like the, if I can schedule it an additional 15 or if I can schedule it for like, like, so if I have an I have a meeting, I know I need an hour. I'll actually schedule it for 90, like giving people like a heads up, like this isn't actually going to take 90 minutes, but it protects my calendar a little bit. So folks aren't sending me like requests where, you know, you can see that, nope, I can't, I'm, you know, I'm in this meeting. But one thing I wasn't quite prepared for was, um, you know, my personal cell phone number, you know, going out to, you know, to all of my colleagues and like, you know, you know, I, I enjoy working with all my colleagues, but it was different. It was very jarring. And like some of them, like, you know, we are, we're friends outside and like we text them, but it was, it was jarring at first to have like, you know, a, a text from a number that I hadn't saved. I was like, how did you get my number? <laughs> you know, and even, you know, and even so like, you know, and our, this hasn't happened. This has only happened to me actually a couple of times and it wasn't, you know, someone on my program, but you know, the concept of like, you know, someone giving out your personal cell phone number, like I'm very, very like, if someone asks me for like one of my colleagues' cell phone numbers, I'm like, no, if, if you don't have it, I'm not giving it to you. Like, you know, you're going to have to email them or call the work phone. Oh my God. 100%. I like cannot stand when people are on my phone. It's like, how did you get here? Because for me, it's like the email also comes to my phone. So, so the reason that you were texting me is absurd. And I don't want you to do that again. Um, but that's exactly what we're talking about is like setting those boundaries. Um, um, Molly, if I can make yeah. one more suggestion with that. Yeah. So, you know, for security purposes, we have to have a token to access our email and work from home. Um, I very purposely opted for a physical token. And before the pandemic, I would leave that token at the office on Friday. So I cannot check my email at home because prior to this, like I was checking my email on a Sunday morning for no reason. And it's as an SCA member too, I was like, what are you doing, Megan? You're not getting paid for this. So if you have the option to do a hard token that, you know, and not have it directly on your phone where it's just an app away, I would recommend doing that disconnect if, if you're able to. For, so, you know, so for some folks, it's just not possible. Like for Fran, I know, I know Fran could never do that, but. I don't know if I can make that commitment, right? That makes me really scared. I am, a, I'm the worst. I literally will wake up and then be sending emails at 7.30 or eight o'clock, just as soon as I wake up. And then like some of the people that I work with, like, why are you awake? Why are you on Gchat? And I'm like, well, I'm just getting, getting some things out of the way while it's on my mind, which is terrible. So I also need to set <laughs> boundaries with myself. Um, I want to shift a little bit. I think some of us answered kind of these questions as we were going on, but I wanted to know for each of us if there was one uh, or more persons that were influential in our decision um, to work in the environment. Is there is there a, a mentor that we had that we wanted to take a moment to celebrate right now? I can uh, just start by going first, um, just because I remember like very vividly when I was in my college years, you know, and being in, you know, marine science and environmental field, wondering like, you know, why are a lot of my advisors not black and do they understand, you know, what I'm going through? And so I remember literally Googling, you know, like black marine biologists or like black environmentalists um, because I wanted a physical mentor. And I came across Majora Carter and she's an environmentalist based uh, out of the South Bronx. And I remember like reading her story um, about how she took her dog, I think it was a TED talk actually. She took her dog on a walk, ended up finding this like, you know, open lot and essentially beautified this place. And I remember like wanting to do something similar in Brooklyn because, you know, like we live in these very urban environments and wanting to make this a green space. And I'm like, that's what, you know, that's what I'm hoping to do. That's what I, you know, want to live for. And, and sort of like create more green spaces in these really great infrastructure, green or non-green places. 
And so Majara Carter, like, although like she and I have never connected physically, was like one of my first, um, I guess, mentors in a way or inspirations, I'd, I'd rather say. Um, so Majora Carter, definitely. And then I've also had so many weird inspirations that necessarily weren't environmentalists, um, but just folks who are doing amazing work. And a lot of my inspiration has come from also like the people I was closest with. So though not one physical person, but like my community in bed right? I think I will always shout out bed because it's so amazing. Um, but just like the community in, in Brooklyn and bed being an inspiration for like, um, so much character, so much charisma. Yeah, exactly. Best I do or die. Um, <laughs> so much character, so much charisma, charisma, and then wanting to continue to bring that part of me in everything that I do, because I feel like in order to really uh, change, I guess, the, the paradigms of how we work, you have to always bring your full self. Um, so my community, Majora Carter, um, and then also, of course, like mentors through high school, that have essentially helped me get to where I am. Like I definitely don't, you know, pass over all of those mentors. So like Murray Fisher, who was the founder of Harbor School, um, huge sort of like, you know, motivator in terms of me continuing on because there were so many days where I was like, you know, I can't do this. This is not for me. Um, and feeling like, you know, I have someone in my corner and of course, like my parents. So my mom and dad who have been phenomenal. Like I remember when I went away to school abroad in the Bahamas, I don't want to ramble too much. Um, when I first was getting scuba dive certified, we had to go get like gear, not knowing what the heck I was doing, what I was buying. I don't know. Like my mom doesn't know. And so we're in this store together, literally trying to figure this out. <laughs> and it was super hilarious because we're like, I don't know, like maybe this mask, this pen, whatever. Um, and the fact that she was super supportive and having my back and essentially letting me do what I was passionate about, um, She's like the hardest working woman I ever like known. So shout out to moms and dad for, you know, pushing through and continuing to like allow me to pursue my passion. So. Yeah, I mean, I think parents are a huge, huge, huge influence. And I know mine definitely are. Um, and I could talk about them for so long. I'm not going to, though, because one of them is here and I don't want to. <laughs> but Benita, what about you? Who are your, your influencers? You know, as a kid, I I loved um, George Washington Carver, and my dad's from Alabama, so I had an opportunity to go to Tuskegee, and I honestly read every caption, everything they had about him. And when I was a kid, they didn't have very many books about Black people other than entertainers and sports people. But I loved George Washington Carver. I loved Booker T. Washington because they talked about self-determination. And over the years, I got to meet Wangari Mathai and just to see how she got the women in her community to reforest their, you know, to take charge. They realized that their community was being deforested. So the things that I do, I, I work in the community to work towards self-determination, to get people to identify the issues in their community. And then we talk about, well, how can we deal with this? You know. And, and so, yeah, those are my mentors in, even though the only person of the three that I mentioned are, you know, are Wangari Mathai, I met her in New York City. Um, she came to speak at the Museum of Natural History, um, but George Washington Carver, all my life, I've, I've looked up to him and just the idea that Booker T. Washington, I mean, they built Tuskegee. It was all about self-determination. What do you think? I have so many, it is, I hate this question because it's so hard to pick a couple because as soon as I finished, I'm gonna want to, I'm gonna think of the 15 others I should have mentioned, but she left already so I can gush and embarrass her. But honestly, my younger sister, Brianna, um, so I'm two years older than Brianna and we're, there are four of us. And I've heard folks say that children are kind of like wolves. If you have more than three, it just becomes like a pack. Um, so, you know, Brianna followed me to Michigan and she's actually Dr. Lung now. She beat me to her doctorate, but you know, it was so comforting to like, you know, have my, have my sister, have my pack mate with me through high school and through college and all these like similar struggles. We got to like bounce them like off together. Um, and there were a couple of times, like it was, 
you know, like I, I mentioned, it was really, it was really, really pale in Massachusetts, especially for trail work and even environmental education. I think only, you know, three of my hundred students were, you know, children of color. And I kind of, I wanted to go home at a couple points. Like I, you know, I, I had been called a slur, like kind of in the streets and half of my core was very supportive. And the other half of my core kept walking and pretended that they didn't hear it because it made them feel too uncomfortable. And I remember talking to my sister that night. I talked to her afterwards and like, I wanted to just, I didn't want to be out there anymore. I was like, I don't want to deal with this. And she was just like, I call her, sometimes I think my sister's a lizard because sometimes she's very just like blunt and straightforward, (laughs) but you know, she's very caring. She's a very caring lizard, but she was just like, are you going to call, are you going to let these people like beat you? Are you going to throw in the quits? Like, did you really do all of this to stop here? And I was like, you're right. So, you know, honestly, just like, you know, my sister just like constantly just like pushing me and pushing me to do better. So then like, I can turn around and like help her with something or help one of our other siblings or someone who looks like us in the future. Um, So that's my, that's the end of my soliloquy to Brianna Lung, but you know, be stereotypical and say my sister. I'm really close with my sister as well. Um, So I definitely can relate. Jerome, I saw that you wanted to to weigh in here. What about you? Yeah, um, so I'll start by, um, I mean, you can um, probably get get it a bit from my story in what I made mention of, but our current director here at Grand Rakutsa Valley, uh, she, uh, her name is Bridget Griswold. She has known me since that slide where it said the beginning. Uh, we had connected then. And even after that internship, I, regardless of what field I entered in, because obviously, as you can see, I'm kind of the, I'm a very uh, kinetic learner. I have to put my hands on stuff and really get in there. And so I've um, had this idea of let's give it a shot for a bunch of different things. Um, but I always knew I'd carry that experience with me. Uh, and I always knew that I'd carry that sort of attitude and mentality with me, having that consciousness and awareness of the world around me. Um, so had this not been my career path either way, um, I know that she's somebody who would have been there. I know that she's somebody who um, would have uh, had some sort of influence regardless of what I chose. And uh, also my dad, again, uh, him being the history channel, animal planet, discovery channel buff that he is, like it was on constantly and you can't help but pick up a few things. And so um, is very much influential in that way. And now uh, my dad and I, we uh, watch the same YouTube channels, even though I have like, we have our own spare time separately and things of that nature. And we're talking about stuff that we've seen. And so, um, yeah, it's been, it's, it's in a way, looking back, it's surreal how it all came to this, but at the same time, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. I think for me, oh my gosh, literally I can't actually discuss it because I will cry, but like Steve Irwin's death like ruined my life. Anyway, I was gonna say for me that um, I felt like, or I, and I still feel this way that everything about my parents' lives have kind of like led me to this point and the choices that they made and the people that they had me around and the opportunities that they, that they provided for me. Um, but I also felt growing up that like, you know, well, maybe that's just me, but you know, you don't believe them a little bit when they're like, well, you could do anything you want. Like, of course, that's like a totally normal thing for you to like. I'm sure there's a lots of other people like that. It's not just you. Um, and so in hearing that, I was like, okay, well, God, they're my parents. They're supposed to say that. And I remember um, feeling like shock um, multiple times in throughout my career um, in environmentalism. The first time that I found out that other Black kids were interested in marine biology um, was when I was an exhibit guide at the National Aquarium in Baltimore. And there were other Black kids in that program. And I showed up to the orientation day and I was like, well, where have you been this whole time? 
Um, and, you know, but then didn't end up on any shifts with them. And so I still felt kind of like there weren't opportunities to connect. And then, you know, really feeling like I love marine biology. I love the ocean. I love sharks. That's my passion. But feeling like I don't want to be in the middle of the ocean in an all white like research vessel, for example, like that does not appeal to me. There are things about that that, you know, I would be worried about and, and um, not feeling like, oh, there's a person I can point to that would say it's okay or can speak to a specific experience or even can vouch for, you know, others. And so, you know, over time, I feel like I tampered down my dreams in, in that way that I wanted to be a marine biologist and then really just moved into um, environmental studies kind of very broadly. Um, but then feeling like, I don't know, in the last five years that like, there are so many black women marine biologists. And I'm like, again, I feel like where, where were you when I was 18 years old or 15 years old and feeling like there were none of us. And so I think one of the biggest things for me um, and one of the reasons I wanted to do this event is that the need to, to network and not in the way to like get a new job, but just to like support each other and to show that it can be done and to share ideas and even just be friends that has nothing to do with this work, um, I think is, is a really important aspect that we haven't necessarily um, been thinking of. I'm so excited to see like all of these different like environmental justice groups um, popping up and like the writers organization um, of groups of black uh, indigenous people of color that are coming together to talk about their place in the environment, their, their rightfully deserved place. And, and I'm always looking for a group of people um, to join and to talk with and to share jobs with. I'm, you know, I'm on a list serve um, for, for green jobs in, in the DMV area because that's where I'm from. And I always am wishing like, oh, I wish there was a black one of these. So if any of you don't know about it though, um, oh, Women in Conservation Collective and Sustainability is a Black women's listserv um, where they share job opportunities. Um, it ranges from environmental education all the way through um, investing. Um, like Tanasia said, Black and Marine Science, they have a really awesome page. Visit their Instagram page, sign up for their events, go to their YouTube channel. They're highlighting amazing people every single day. Um, and you know, continue to build those bonds with each other. Um, I think that is is kind of where I'd like to call it. I know I've kept you all into the midnight hour. Um, I really just want to say thank you to all of our panelists for joining us for talking about your work. I think it's important, um, even if we go over time, to talk about why why uh, our work is important and to share all of the things that are happening. One of the best things about Clearwater is that we're serving this large area. So from where Benita lives up, upstate all the way down to where Tanasia lives in Brooklyn, we can come to a dock near you. We can talk about the Hudson River. We can pull fish out of the river and share them with kids and get it, them a chance to use their feelings and, and talk about what they're experiencing. Um, so again, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for the atten to the attendees. Special thank you to Clearwater. Thank you so much, Ruthie, who's our program director. She is our chat moderator tonight, and she worked with me every day on bringing this webinar to life. Um, I want to say good night. Please support our work. We're looking forward to continuing to break down barriers to the river um, with community groups, with schools, um, again, from Albany all the way down to Brooklyn. Uh, in the environmental industry and in the sailing industry. Good night and thank you.